We're hoping to get to know the members of the body of Christ across all of our various jurisdictions and regions. We may worship in various languages or even on different calendars, but we have so much in common. Come get to know someone new and see how they're living out this Orthodox faith in another corner of the world. After all, every person is an icon of Christ, and as we'll see, every person has a story to tell. If you have a question for tonight's guest, we invite you to call in and join the conversation at 1-855-237-2346. That's 1-855-AF-RADIO. Now, here's Elisa. It is Sunday, April 7th, 2024, and we are live on Ancient Faith Radio. Welcome to Everyday Orthodox. I'm Elisa Bielitich Davis. And you know, we get together here on Sunday nights to meet everyday Orthodox Christians. You know, Orthodox Christians here in North America, we are sort of spread out between different jurisdictions. We're worshiping in different languages, on different calendars. And you can have an Orthodox Christian living right down the street and have no idea that you're both Orthodox because you go to different parishes or, you know, somehow you just haven't connected it. So, I find that I think the best path to unity for us is to just get to know each other and to get to know our brothers and sisters and to meet people from other jurisdictions, other parts of the country. So that's what we're doing. And uh, I personally, I think it's a blast. So (laughs) thank you for joining us. And we hope you'll be back with us next week as well. So uh, tonight we have a great guest for you. And I want you to know you're welcome to call in and ask any questions that you may have. And uh, the number to do that is one eight five five AF radio. That is one eight five five two three seven two three four six. And if you call Matushka Trudy Richter, our producer will be right there answering your call. She'll pat you right through, and you can ask whatever questions you like. We are streaming on the Ancient Faith website. We're on the Ancient Faith app. We are on Facebook Live, and we're on YouTube. So if you want to see our happy faces, our smiling faces, you can come over to YouTube. And check us out in video. It's very exciting stuff. So uh, without any further ado, though, let me tell you about tonight's guest. Uh, I actually met him at one of the Ancient Faith Conferences, at a creator conference, because he has a really neat project going on, actually. So his name is Michael Bachlig. And uh, he's a sales account executive. He's married. As wife, he and his wife, Elizabeth, have three children. And uh, he's been an Orthodox Christian all his life, although uh, he's actually a second-generation convert, if you can say that. His parents were converts, which I actually think is really neat because, you know, it hasn't been very long that we've had a lot of Orthodox converts. And now that we do, we have this next generation, and then their children are a next generation, and they're sort of, you know— convert families who are now Orthodox for generations. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, Michael's father is actually a priest, Father Timothy Bachlig. He's in the Antiochian Church at St. Michael's in Van Nuys, California. Uh, And Michael actually does a lot of work with the church. He's his parish council chairman at St. Nicholas Antiochian Orthodox Church in Springdale, Arkansas. He's also, um, he started up something really neat. It's the Antiochian Men. It's a men's ministry organization operating within the Antiochian Archdiocese. And um, it's actually, I think it's really the Diocese of Miami in the Southeast. Uh, But so Michael, in June of 2019, was appointed as president of the Antiochian Men by His Grace Bishop Nicholas. And uh, he continues his service building up that organization. They just had their first conference, and it's really uh, it's really neat. I think you're going to enjoy learning about it and just sort of the story of, like, why did Michael think that was a great idea and what are they doing and what's going on there? It's it's really pretty neat. Also, I want to mention that he's on the Diocesan uh, Ministry Council in the Diocese of Miami in the Southeast, and so he helps plan uh, spiritual retreats throughout the year at the diocese level, and so now the Antiochian men That's just one more of the retreats that he is planning. But uh, without any further ado, I would love to introduce you to Michael. Michael, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Elise. It's a blessing and an honor to be on with you. Oh, I'm so glad to have you on. I know we talked about you coming on and then it took us forever. And I'm so glad we connected and got this together because I think it's going to be really a great conversation. So welcome. And tell us, where does your story begin? I I can tell from your voice you're not from Arkansas. I already knew that anyway. No, not originally. So, uh, yes, I've lived all over the country. And you mentioned my father's an Orthodox priest. My parents converted to Orthodoxy in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So that's where I was born. And uh, they actually were 
searching for a common faith. They both came from Protestant backgrounds. They were students at Oral Roberts University. My father actually was studying under my grandfather, and one of the things my grandfather would do is send his students out to the different denominations of Christianity, and he would start with the Orthodox Church. And so he would send his students there and and start with the original church, the ancient church. And so my parents actually fell in love with Orthodoxy, and they they converted at a time when there wasn't much in terms of literature compared to now. I mean, ancient faith has so much out there in terms of books, and there's so much has been translated into English. That just wasn't the case in the late 60s, you know, early 70s. That's about the time when my parents would have first become aware uh, by the late 70s is when they converted. So I was born in 1981. I'm 43 years old now. Uh, but I I actually grew up on the East Coast. So my father decided to become a priest, went to St. Vladimir Seminary. Don't remember Oklahoma or New York very well, but I, <laughs> all my early memories, I can tell you, were from just outside of Philadelphia. My father was assigned to St. George Antiochian Orthodox Church in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. So I was there from age two until age 10. And then we moved across the country. My father was transferred to St. Michael Antiochian Orthodox Church in Van Nuys, and he's been there ever since. So I lived in Los Angeles for 18 years of my life. I left when I was 28 years old and started moving around with different jobs and my career. It just brought me to different places. I was in Texas for a short time, six months or so, and then I went to Indiana for a year. And then now Northwest Arkansas, I've been here for 14 years Uh, But I'll tell you that my story is not probably the typical one. I didn't really take my faith seriously when I was younger, especially as a young man. And being a PK, right, a priest kid, being the son of a priest came with a lot of expectations. Unfortunately, I fell for a lot of traps as a young man. The devil set out there for me. And, you know, I was very rebellious. I just rebelled hard, which, you know, PKs get a bad rap. But in my case, it was deservedly so. I was kind of living into that stereotype. And and being out in California, I can tell you all the temptations and the culture out there is just crazy. And it wasn't until I really experienced a big crisis in my life about seven years ago that it, it really was the wake-up call that I needed. It's unfortunate it took that. But once that happened, I realized I needed to get my life back on the right track. And I needed to take my faith seriously. I started intensely studying the faith. I started listening to hundreds of podcasts on Ancient Faith Radio. I, I still do. I love it. And I mean, it's it's crazy because I never would do that when I was a young man. And it wasn't until I really wanted it for myself, I had to go through some real suffering, that I, I just started connecting all the dots. And I realized all the things that I had experienced before, I just started, they came into focus and they started to make sense. And I didn't have enough intellectual knowledge about the Orthodox faith. So once I started adding that, you know, I was no longer going through the motions because I was for so long. I took my Orthodox faith for granted. So I tell people now I'm a cradle Orthodox convert. I like that. I like that very much. You know, it is an interesting, as you said, you know, it shouldn't take that, right? It shouldn't take this crisis moment. But on the other hand, you know, I think this is, this is where we read in scripture that we, we have this cross and you come to love the cross because the cross is the thing that saves you, you know, and it really... Yeah. It's really true. And for, for different people, it has to be different things. And uh, similarly, I was, I was not born Orthodox, but I converted uh, through marriage. And I didn't really understand Orthodoxy, and I didn't get it. And uh, I just, I didn't value it, I think, as much as I should have. I, I, I thought, oh, you know, this is an acceptable church. This is cool. We'll go here on Sundays. That's fine. You know, and I just didn't understand it at all. And to be fair, like you said, there was a time when there weren't a lot of resources in English to learn about sure. it. But sometimes it does, and that for me too, it took a big crisis to really get my attention and to. Some, I feel like, in some ways, we have to be humbled enough to realize that we can't do it on our own. So yes. that then we start looking around, trying to figure out, you know, okay, God, you know, how do I lean on you? What are the tools yeah. at my disposal? That's so true, and I think that in my case, I also was conditioned by this very individualized culture that we live in. There's there's such a spirit of hyper individualism in our culture in American culture. And I was taking a, a very individual individualized approach, even to the Orthodox faith, which I think a lot of us can very easily let that happen because we're, we're in such a different environment with Orthodoxy is very countercultural in this country. And so just even growing up in the church, I wasn't immune from all of the cultural influences from all the things that we see and hear in media and 
And I was just very selfishly pursuing my own, you know, selfish desires. I was in this pursuit of happiness, this perpetual s- pursuit of happiness that doesn't ever fully, fully fill your cup, right? I didn't know what the difference between happiness and joy was. And then once I had the chance to serve the church with the Antiochian men, I, I got a taste of what joy is, and it it's much different. It, it It is more than enough to sustain me now, and it makes those things I used to enjoy not fun anymore, which is really beautiful. It is beautiful. It is really beautiful. And it's interesting, too. You know, I think about your dad as a priest, right? I'm sure he's trying to pass down the faith to you. I'm sure he's doing all the things he can to try to to try to like really make it matter to you but it just sort of goes to show that as parents and I know you're a parent as well we don't get to make those choices for our kids and we don't get to uh you know, is there anything your parents could have done differently that would have made you like snap to attention sooner do you think you know it's it's hard it's hard to it's hard to hold anything against them because I'm so grateful for the fact that they converted to orthodoxy. They gave me the foundation that I needed. They gave me the foundation of my faith so that when I did get into trouble in my life, I knew where to go, right? And I knew where to come home. So I'm very grateful for that. I think the hardest thing for me is being the son of a priest, you see things from the inside. And our priests have a very difficult job. It's almost an impossible job. So I don't I don't really think that I could say that they could have done anything differently because how how much I saw them sacrifice for other people in the parish it was really on me I was too selfish and and probably resentful because you know when you call your father father and everybody else in the parish is calling him father you're sharing your father with so many people and if he's at your football game but somebody is dying at the hospital he has to leave your football game to rush to somebody's bedside that's dying as a teenager, that's there's you. It's hard to understand that, and even if you do, there's built-in resentment that happens just without even realizing it. So, it, you know, I have a soft place in my heart for anyone that's the son or daughter of a priest because I know how hard it is and what that comes with being in a priest family. Hearing things about church politics, you know, it made me very cynical when I was young. Um, and it wasn't until much later, again, once I'd gone through what I had mentioned, when His Grace Bishop Nicholas came to me, and and I had just gone through, you know, a, a, an intense period of a couple of years studying the Orthodox faith for the first time, reading scripture, trying to understand the context, reading all these books, these podcasts, self-educating myself, having all these epiphanies. I felt like a convert, really, because I had all this zeal and this energy to do something with it. And so soon after I had just been in the depths of darkness— His Grace Bishop Nicholas suggests, maybe I should be the president of this brand new organization that he was playing. And I can't take credit for founding it because it was really his vision. Bishop Nicholas founded the Antiochian men. He was out recruiting. And in my zeal at that time, I said, of course, I would love to do that. Right. (laughs) I, I just I wanted so badly for there to be a men's organization because I knew how badly men need brotherhood. And that's what Bishop Nicholas was talking about. So I just said, of course I would. And then I took, I just had to hesitate and think, who am I to do this? I mean, with all the things that I've done, with what I've been through, but later the bishop told me, you know, that, that, that didn't matter to him. It was what I knew now. And I think he saw in me someone who was willing to work, who wanted to repent and to, and to really create increase, not just to stop sinning. But now that I knew what I knew, I had to do something with it. And Bishop Nicholas's vision it's so beautiful because men have been under attack really in the last few years it's intensified but it's been going on for quite some time and i saw so many things happening now around me i can't unsee it now i can't not see what's happening on a spiritual level because i went through it i went through it as a young man and i see so many young men today that are just under full assault that are confused that don't understand even what it means to be a man i struggled with that uh, that are are searching for material solutions to things that really are spiritual illnesses. These things that I think now the reason why so many men are coming into the Orthodox Church is a phenomenon that's really been happening quite a bit, especially in my diocese in the Southeast. Yeah. You know, the men are looking for something that is strong, a hard, solid rock to cling to amidst the chaos of the culture around us, which is just going haywire. And so for me, I never knew what my calling was, right? I, my identity was in being the son of a priest. My identity was not in Christ. But once I made that switch 
and truly wanted to have my identity in Christ, my calling was very clear. And especially when my bishop is telling me, you should lead this organization. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I show up at the Parish Life Conference expecting many other people would want to do it. And there I am, right? the only one. You're like, I'm going to have to fight for this position. It's like, no, no, sir. I didn't think Everybody there was else a knows how hard that no. is. <laughs> I, don't think, I didn't think there was a chance I would get it, but no one else volunteered. Wow. And so I said, okay, okay, well, then we're going to do this. And so I, ever since then, I've just been full speed ahead. And the joy that I now get from serving the church, from serving my neighbor, for serving my brothers in Christ, it just it goes beyond description. We were so focused on mentorship about serving the church, serving our neighbor, really living the faith, and and really just being strong men. Because I think, again, these men coming to the church, they need to get plugged into healthy brotherhoods. There are a lot of them coming from places that are from a very confused or troubled or broken background, and they need that healthy brotherhood, that male-to-male communion that's really missing. And yeah. once they get exposed to that, they really start to flourish. And that's the joy that you feel when you mentor someone younger or less experienced than you in the church. We need more of that, Elisa. Yeah. Well, so I want, you, you've brought up two really huge and interesting things to me, right? Like the first one, just this question of like the life of the priest's family and the life of a yeah. priest and how difficult it is. And I want to talk about that. But I also want to talk about, like when you say men are under attack, do you mean spiritual attack? What do you mean? And describe it and, and tell me how you see it. Yeah, the attacks are, in a lot of cases, very subtle. And it's it definitely, there's a spiritual attack happening. There's a spiritual deprivation, I feel, that men have because they don't realize what's really going on. And I think this happened, this really started in the sexual revolution in the 60s, where before men could be attacked, women were attacked. And I think there were things that happened in the sexual revolution. There were things that, and I've researched this now, I, I can actually see what the demonic strategy has been since the 60s. And you could argue it even started before that in the Industrial Revolution, where where things were becoming automated and men couldn't work with their hands as much anymore. Now we're in cubicle farms. I'm in corporate America, and that's the norm now, right? I mean, one of the things that I think confuses men is what are the roles? Because we hear so much about, you know, who's the... If the man is the head of the household, does that mean he's the boss, right? Because we have to know in our culture, who's the boss? Who reports to who? Like that's not, that's not the right question, right? We both have right. roles as male and female. And that was, goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. So one thing that our spiritual advisor, Father Hans, has said over and over again, has taught us is that men create with their hands and women create with their bodies. And so when men create, it's to take the stuff of creation, to fashion it into something else. And when women create, now they bear children, of course, there's a material reality to that, but there's a spiritual reality to filling the world with life. They, the women do this in the church, which I think is an even more important role than the male role in the church. If we lose the woman's role in the church, the church loses its life, if you think about it. And so this attack on manhood is really an attack on understanding what it means to be a man. And all of the answers to what men are struggling with are in our anthropology, our orthodox anthropology. And that's what I think men are drawn to. They're drawn to the fact that they know that there's a structure to creation, that there's an order in creation. And it should be about order, not chaos, right? So that's what I think is drawing the men in. They see a hierarchical structure, they see patriarchy, but they don't see it as a toxic thing. They don't see that as something that is oppressive. Because we also hear so much about, you know, who is the oppressed and who is the oppressor these days. It's not about that at all, right? To be in synergy, we each participate in each other's role. So it's not who's above the other. We're constantly serving the other. So to understand husband and wife, I mean, that, that to me, I didn't have a proper understanding prior to really digging into this. And I think that attack on manhood is, is very subtle, but it's starting to really confuse men as to what it really means to be in the male role. I think a lot of men think that they should become more like women, that a lot of the, the things that they're hearing in the culture are saying that, and that women should become more like men, which is yeah. adding to the confusion. Yeah. But male and female are, although equal, it doesn't mean they're identical, right? So right. we can be equal as male and female in the church, but we don't have to do exactly the same thing. In fact, we're not supposed to. Right. We, we it's it's wonderful how we all have so many gifts in the church because God wants us to rely on each other. 
to need each other, to be in communion, yeah. to be an icon of the Trinity, persons in community and not individuals. So this attack, I know this is the long answer to your question. It's, mm -hmm. it's starting to, I think, make men question what it really means to be a man, to be a woman, mm -hmm. and what the man's role should be in, as the father of their children, as the priest of their household. Right. Right. All of this is getting twisted now in our culture. And so that's the attack that I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, and I think it's interesting, too. Like you said, who's the boss? You know, who gets to be in charge is the question that we have in America. Right. It's this constant yeah. like, well, and it, and it is this model of this power and control and oppression and these different these ways of seeing relationships. Right. And, um, you know, the orthodox model. Christ is the boss, obviously, right? like he's yeah. the king. And then we're all serving him and we're serving each other. And how do we best serve each other? And uh, it, it is, it is, I think you're correct when you say that yet that this is very confusing for men. It's very difficult for men to try to work out like what does a healthy man look like? And I think in part of that is too, that we've had a lot of unhealthy ideas of what masculinity is in the U.S. Yes. We've had a lot of, and I think too, that, you know, I think that there's some confusion for women as well. I think mm -hmm. uh, happily motherhood kind of has this biological way of showing you who you are in a way, although not all women, of course, get the opportunity to be mothers or want to be mothers. But so I think in some ways that makes us slightly less confused, but but it is confusing, I think, for all of us, really. But uh, I do. And I wonder, too, you know, to what extent I think men get a lot of messages about sexuality. They get a lot of message. You know, our culture is just constantly want our culture wants us to consume things. Right. So, like, you're supposed yeah. to buy things. So as a man, your status is having a job that pays you a lot of money and you're supposed to go get a really nice car and you should have a super hot wife and perhaps also some women on the side. And, you know, there's like this this energy of what our culture is holding up right as as a an ideal of masculinity what does the church hold up as an ideal of masculinity because i think it's not necessarily the same thing that like america has always held up you know what i mean like i think our culture kind of came in a little sideways in the first place and now it's gone way off the off, yeah. the, off the tracks Oh, I totally agree. And I think as men, we look to Christ. Christ is a man. And even saying that now these days is controversial, which it shouldn't be. Christ is a man. Right. And so you're, you're exactly right. I think that there's, there's a lot that we can learn from the saints. We can learn from Christ himself and, and keep our eye on the ball. Because the, what we're hearing in the culture is that in some places you're hearing that there's really no difference between male and female, that it's on the sliding scale. And, and that's very dangerous, right? So, so the Orthodox faith has a position on that and always has. It's in our theology of what it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve again and the roles that they were both given and our understanding of what that is. And, and it is very foreign in this culture to think of it in these terms. And like you said, when you're worried about who's the boss or who's, who's the one that's in control, it's really the wrong question, right? Because we should ideally be looking at the servant leadership model in everything, in our jobs, in our married life, in our church, right? So yeah, it's, 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 it's an uphill battle for sure. I think that, that I fell again for a lot of traps because I was, I was sucked into this mentality of individualism and materialism. And well, like you said, this, this idea of success, it all comes down to how we define success. If our success is just making more and more money, getting the bigger house, you know, getting, uh, a beautiful wife, you know, it, that's not the goal that's in the gospel, right? So, so if it's so contrary to that, we need to start looking at what Christ says should be the goal. And then what happens when you do make that the goal and things aren't going to be easy, right? Is that, Christ actually said it's going to be difficult, right? So when yeah. those things happen, it shows you you're actually on the right track. And it's just, it's counterintuitive in a culture that's so consumerist, like you said, so focused on you know, in a capitalist society, success is measured a lot of times by money, monetary yeah. success. And so, yeah, I think that spiritual element, uh, I think Ancient Faith has been doing a great job. The, the Lord of Spirits podcast has been wildly popular for this reason, which I know skews very heavily male as, as far as the audience goes. And and I think that that's not a coincidence. I think men are are starting to realize this materialism thing is not working out for them. And there has to be something yeah. more. 
So I think that's what's driving this phenomenon that we're seeing of men just flooding into the church. And I know because I've seen that even in our Antiochian men conference and retreat that happened a few weeks ago. It's a huge topic. And, uh, and you know, I, I see this continuing to grow. I see even more men coming in. I think the ones coming in now are those early adopters and the floodgates are going to be opening in just uh, maybe a couple of years from now. You think so? You think it'll get even bigger? Than it I is. Do. I mean, in the sense I really this, do. because right now there is, I certainly see in our parish, um, we're in Austin, Texas, and in the South, I don't know if you guys know this if you're not in the South, but in the South, Orthodoxy is growing like crazy. And I do, I would say part of that is that most of our parishes are in English. We're kind of reaching out, and we're also in these cultures of people who are traditionally Christian, but are are struggling and trying to figure it out. But there's also the, you know, they call it the Peterson Pajot pipeline sometimes where it's like there's this group of young men that we see who are really struggling and trying to figure out what it means to be a man. And sometimes they do come in, you know, with some weird ideas about being like super masculine, about dominating and these kind of ideas. And they hear traditional when they hear orthodoxy and they're thinking of maybe a different tradition than we are. But as they come in and they're listening to the Lord of Spirits. And they are coming to church and they are going through catechism. Amazing and beautiful things happen and they find something really worth holding on to. And then they Such, bring their wives and their kids and everybody else. Yes, comes along. but that's an important point because what you just described is the, it's, you call it the pathway or it's kind of the on-ramp for a lot of these men. What we see, there's a difference between internet orthodoxy and orthodoxy on the internet. Yeah. And internet orthodoxy, unfortunately, is taking a lot of angry men and it's trying to weaponize the faith. And there's yeah. there's there's people out there that are speaking on behalf of the Orthodox Church on YouTube or other platforms that really have no business doing that. And yeah. unfortunately, they end up communicating more of their own dysfunction than they do the Orthodox faith to people. And it's it's a double-edged sword. Some people find out about orthodoxy from these places, but yep. if they only stay there and they and they never walk in the door of the church, they become this internet theologian and this maverick that thinks that they're this warrior monk out there on social media to just pick apart every apologetic. Like you know the type. I'm, yeah, oh, I know exactly what you're talking so about. That's that's why our organization is so different, and I would argue is so needed. We're different because we're we're under the direction of a bishop, Bishop Nicholas. We don't do anything without his blessing. We have board meetings. We talk about it. We're within a diocese of the Antiochian Archdiocese. When men come to the church, they get plugged into us. They get mentored. They have someone who is more experienced that comes alongside them and brings them into the healthy way of doing things, finding a spiritual father, engaging in the liturgy, living the faith, not just talking about it on the internet. Right now, we have a lot of things on the internet. We have a YouTube channel. We have a website. We have our own social media platform. We have a lot of things that we do that mirror, uh, you know, what you would see out there. But again, this is done within the church, just like with ancient faith, right? And these are good resources that people should be looking at. And with what's out there now, it's become a minefield, really, because a lot of people, the internet's been a game changer. There's a lot of good with that because people are finding the Orthodox Church, but we need more organizations like the Antiochian men. We have the Antiochian women. They've been around since the, the 70s. And, you know, growing up in the church, Elisa, I was wondering, why isn't there an Antiochian men? I always wondered, why can't we have a men's group? The Antiochian women have been around for decades, over 50 years now, actually, and they've been doing great work. And so that's why I was so excited. I'll go back to when I was approached. I wanted this to happen because I thought it was long overdue. Because I think we need strong men in the church to strengthen the church. And that's that's only going to be done if there's an organized effort from the laity. The, the priests, the clergy can't do it all. They shouldn't do it all. Yeah. It's not always just up to them. We need to all be working in synergy, even within the church. So what you described, it's dangerous because you can have these so-called black-pilled, angry alt-right perspectives of men that just get lost in this more toxic version of what they see manhood is. And they honestly are just trying to weaponize the Orthodox faith. That's, that's not how you should do it at all. So we're offering the alternative in the church, again, in obedience to a bishop that's giving us the direction, it's his vision. And we're wanting to do what we can in the church to serve each other and to serve the church. That's what's needed. It really is. And I think it's, as you said, when, when people are coming in, 
especially young men. I love how you use that phrase, weaponized the faith, right? Because yeah. there is a way that there's just, there's a lot of anger. Right? I saw a video online and it was like about how we have to fight sin, right? So as an Orthodox person, if I say I'm fighting sin, I mean, I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm going to avoid, you know, inappropriate content online and on TV. I'm going to, I'm not sleeping with somebody, right? It's all this stuff that's not what they're talking about, right? They're like, fight yeah. sin, I'm going to go out and I'm just going to beat somebody up because he's gay or something. And it's just like, oh, that's, you know, they're talking about your own sin, right? Like, look inside. But uh, it is it is very interesting. And I we have to take a break. But first, I actually, we have a really good question from uh, one of our YouTube viewers. So I want to I want to answer this question first and then we'll go for our break. So AJ on YouTube asked, could you explain how the Orthodox view of headship can you explain the Orthodox view of headship differently than the Gothard view that has unfortunately influenced American Christianity? I don't know if you're um, as familiar with Gothard. I know he's kind of evangelical circles, but um, if you're able to contrast the two, that would be really helpful. If not, just tell us, like, what is the Orthodox view of headship? What is, and of course, we're talking about within the family, this idea that the man is the head of the household. Yeah, the head of what the household. What does that look like in traditional Christianity? Well, I'll focus on that. I think that that being the head of the household, again, it doesn't just mean that you are the boss and everyone reports to you. I, I come from corporate America, so that's the language we're so used to. You know, I, I learned this from Father Stephen DeYoung. There's the very famous uh, letter from St. Paul about, you know, wives, submit yourselves to your husband, right? And uh, And that actually was not the controversial part of the letter at the time it was written. I learned this from Father Stephen DeYoung. It was Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved and died, gave his life for the church, right? So yeah. headship, if you understand it properly, is really an act of service. It's an act of serving, for example, your spouse in a synergistic marriage, where you, as an icon of Christ, if you were to become more like Christ who came to serve and not to be served, what does that look like as a husband and as a father and as the priest of your family, as the head of your household? It means putting everyone in your family before yourself. So headship is not this power structure of domination, of control, of dictatorship. That's that's an unhealthy and a, a twisted version of headship. That's a dictatorship. Headship just means that you're essentially a slave. If you look at the priest, the priest isn't above everybody in the church. They're the one that's serving all of us, even more so the bishop is serving everyone in the diocese. The idea of headship is you're going to put everybody in that family before yourself. You're going to serve them before you even think of your own needs. And you're going to lead through a service model. So I'll tell you, that's where I went wrong for so much of my life, where I did want to put myself first. As a young man, I did not have a proper understanding of the sacrament of marriage. You know, that got me into really big trouble. And I had my eyes opened uh, unfortunately, having to go through some things to realize I was approaching the whole thing all wrong. I was not Christ-like in my headship of my family. And to strive to become that, you have to look at what Christ did, putting everyone else before himself and ultimately dying for us on the cross, which is the ultimate act of a warrior to, to voluntarily ascend the cross, right? That's headship. That's taking everything upon yourself for the sake of everyone else. Okay, so headship is, it's, it's semantics in our culture now where we think that headship, oh, they're in charge. It's, it's not supposed to be that way. It's not supposed to be explained that way. And I think we just get in trouble thinking about headship as being, you know, the one with all the power. And that's where you get into this cultural Marxist, deconstructionist criticism yeah. of patriarchy and of uh, hierarchy in general. No, we should be there to serve everyone and to put them first. So that would be my response. That's, that's excellent. And I think, you know, that is, there is a misunderstanding of headship in our American culture, in our American history. I think it goes back before Gothard, to tell you the truth. I think it goes way back. You know, I think, I think we think we're founded by Christians. We're founded by deists. Like this is a, this country. We're confused about what these things look like, but thank yeah. God we're able to, to stop and just sort of yeah. look back and say, okay, well, what did the early church think about headship? What did yeah. Paul say? What did he really say? But right. Could, and what, I'll who just... are our examples? It's Christ. It's all of these beautiful bishops who, yeah. who have laid down their lives 
and who, yeah. you know, all these monks who sit there and they're accepting confessions all night long and never getting any sleep, right? Like that's headship. Right. They're leading yeah. those people by serving them. And, and, I, and I was just going to add something. Father Andrew Stephen Damick told me once, it means that you go first. Like headship means you take the initiative. That's what the priest does. You need a priest to have that role to initiate. So headship may mean that you're the one that starts things. It means that as the father and as the priest of my household, ideally, I'm the first one at the icon, icon wall, icon corner with my family, and they join me. Now, if I'm not, maybe somebody else starts that. But that's my job is to go first. So headship simply just means we need to take the initiative. So men, we need to step up. That's beautiful. I love that. Okay, we're going to take our short break. We're late on it. Our apologies, Matushka Trudy. But uh, we'll be taking a short break. We'll be right back. Keep in mind, if you want to call in, you're welcome to 1-855-AF-RADIO, 1-855-237-2346. We'll be right back. Everyday Orthodox with Elisa Bielitich Davis will be back in a moment. Give Elisa and her guest a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Forge enduring connections with Orthodox brothers. Strengthen your faith, be encouraged, and challenge yourself at the first ever Ancient Faith Men's Retreat. The retreat features four engaging speakers, daily services and Sunday Divine Liturgy, fellowship with like-minded Orthodox men, and more at the beautiful Antiochian Village Conference Center in Bolivar, Pennsylvania. Thursday, August 22nd through Sunday, August 25th. Speakers include Hiram Monk Basil of Holy Cross Monastery in Wayne, West Virginia, Father John Strickland, author of the Paradise and Utopia book series, Father John Oliver, the host of the AFR podcast Hearts and Minds, and Father Michael Mark Antoni, priest at St. John Chrysostom Orthodox Church in Nashville, Tennessee. For more information and to register, please visit store.ancientfaith.com slash events. We're back with Everyday Orthodox with Elisa Bielitich Davis. Do you have a question for Elisa and today's guest? Call in now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Here again is Elisa. And welcome back to AF uh, to, <laughs> to Everyday Orthodox on Ancient Faith Radio. I'm Elisa Davis, and I am talking with Michael Bachleg. And uh, he is the president of Antiochian Men, Amen, which is, I think, just one of the coolest names out there. But, uh, <laughs> Michael, okay, we have another question. This is a more practical one, and this is coming from one of our YouTube viewers. And they say, how do you deal with church men who have families and children about our children's ages? You and me and him, we all do have kids the same age pretty much. Uh, when you ask for us men to get together and take the children uh, to maybe go out to play, to get all the kids together, to get together for an event, right? And all you get is, I'm busy. Like, do you get that in your parish? Are you getting that in your diocese? Because I feel like, you know, we get that a lot in our parishes when we're all trying to get things going with the people there. Do you? Is that what you hear back from people? And if so, how do you handle it? Yeah, I think everyone's in a different season of life. And I remember having children that were young that needed much more attention than they do now. I have two teenagers, almost three now, which is scary. Uh, they're much more self-sufficient. And men's ministry is difficult because men have schedules that are very different from each other. There's so many things pulling men in different directions. You have men working during the day, overnight shifts in the evenings, and then you could be mul multiple jobs to provide for their family. And then you can have the, the father, as the fatherhood aspect of it. And, and men being busy, I'll tell you, we've, we've had a lot of success using technology in good ways to offer options for men to engage regardless of what season of life that they're in. So we just finished a virtual retreat yesterday. Uh, we have a Lenten retreat during Great Lent. Every year, this is our fifth annual that happened yesterday. We had men logging in from all over our diocese, and that happens twice a year. We have a another virtual retreat in the fall. We give an option for people that can't travel because of commitments with their family. We did an in-person conference and retreat a few weeks ago, and uh, and at the local level, it's really all about our local brotherhoods. You know, we have 
We offer all kinds of things. We even get together for a monthly Bible study with Father Stephen DeYoung on Zoom. He's been very gracious over these last five years to do a men's Bible study with us. And guys are logging in with their kids on their laps in some cases, putting them to bed while they're in the Bible study. Uh, when we do get in person, I mean, we have in my local parish, we have a monthly men's breakfast, which is on Saturday mornings. There's some men that can't make it because that's a very sacred time for them to make breakfast for their own kids. And we get that. But what is key is that you offer a variety of things for people to engage, regardless of the season of life that they're in. If they're super busy with multiple jobs, we have our own podcast, the Coming Out of Chaos podcast, so that they can at least hear something from uh, another man, Bryce Kirk, from our, our diocese and myself. We do that podcast. So even just like Ancient Faith does, you have a way to stay connected to the church where you may not be able to walk into the doors of the church as often as you'd like, but there's still a way for you to be connected to, in our case, our brotherhood. Um, We do get it. I'll tell you that what's interesting, though, is that as we've grown over these last five years, the men have been able to figure things out. They all make deals with their wives. And when the Antiochian women have something going on, (laughs) the men will say, hey, I'll help and watch the kids if you can watch them next month when I want to do this with the Antiochian men. So that actually is a beautiful thing because husbands and wives have helped each other to cover for each other or even friends. If you have a single parent, like we have some single dads and they make arrangements. And because of how compelling our topics have been to really get to the core of what men are struggling with, the men, they really look forward to our events. We, we, thank God, have have really seen such a positive, overwhelming response to everything that we've planned, that they find a way. They find a way to to make sure their kids are taken care of. And we do our best to plan around the times that we know fathers would be busy, right? Um, but, you know, we're not going to be able to do, to, to have everyone participate in everything. So that's why we're doing so many different kinds of things. And again, using technology in good ways, just like Ancient Faith does, to bring some level of connection to those men out there that are busy with multiple kids or multiple jobs or both. I love that. Well, and I think so, so it's kind of a multi-level thing, right? Like part of it is you got to make sure that you're doing this at convenient times that you have a lot of different availability, but part of it too is that if what you're doing is really meaningful enough and it's really feeding the need, people find a way. And I think that's, I think that's absolutely true. But uh, And so, you know, if you're in a parish and you're struggling with this, where you're trying to connect with men in your parish and nobody sort of feels available to it, um, I mean, you can connect with Antiochian men, and then you've got that connection, whether they catch up with you or not. But then also over time, you know, you'll probably be able to invite people to retreats and to get people involved in different things. You know, there are all kinds of different ways to get a men's group together in your parish. And, you know, in our parish, I know our men's group actually started as on Bright Wednesday, they would have a steak dinner for men. They'd have steaks and like some of them would be smoking cigars or whatever, but it sort of, it appealed to men who maybe wouldn't normally come to a Bible study. And then over time, it grows into this beautiful fellowship. And so sometimes you have to go around it, you know, sometimes you have to, you have to yep. figure out what people will do and just get them connected first and let God do his work. And, you know? and food brings them in too. I, I mentioned we it's do a true. men's breakfast. Where our our breakfasts have become legendary. Our priest said we should open a food truck actually because it is so <laughs> good. We cook our own food and that breakfast is, I'm telling you, it is first class. But you know, the funny thing is, I mean, men don't want to be in business meetings, especially if they've been in meetings all week. And then it's a Saturday. The last thing you want to do is sit through a boring business meeting. So we don't call it that. We call it a fellowship. We get, we have food, we have great conversation and we slip in some things that we want to prioritize in the church and say, Hey, we need to get together and help somebody move. Or, you know, the church building needs to be painted. Let's, let's get a service project going. But if you bring them in with the food, then you can slip in these things that, Hey, we need to organize. We need to actually do this. Keep things spiritually focused for sure. That must be the case. And and our top goal as the Antiochian men is to become more like God. And we do that by helping each other in the context of a brotherhood. So if you're not in each other's presence, it's, it's much more difficult. So bringing people in with food is a great first step. I love that. I love that. So you mentioned you have a Bible study with Father Stephen DeYoung, which is amazing. How, uh, if, if I'm listening to this show and I'm just like, that's amazing. How do I, how do I sign on for this? How does someone get involved in Antiochian men? Yeah, well, we have the website. You just go to antiochianmen.org and you can see everything we've got going on on that homepage. 
Um, one of the upcoming events, I'm actually going to be taking part in the upcoming Ancient Faith Men's yes. Retreat in August. I heard the ad That's for that, awesome. and I'm very excited. I was invited to lead a Antiochian Men's Session as part of that. So I'm planning to be there. I That's hope cool. those listening will be there, too. Uh, so that's listed as an event. We have the uh, upcoming events really listed there, but then all of our videos are on our homepage. So anytime we do a virtual retreat, we do in-person retreats, we record those sessions, we put it out for free on our YouTube channel. Those YouTube videos are embedded in our website. So even if someone doesn't have YouTube, if you just go to antiochianmen.org, you can see all of our video content. Our podcast is there on the website and a lot of success stories. You can sign up for our newsletter. That's how you get the link to join our Bible study. So we have many people joining from all over the country and even from other countries now. Uh, we advertise this as an Antiochian men event in our diocese, but we never chase anyone away. There's a lot of people that have now joined us, and we uh, we always welcome people to that. And it's usually on the third Thursday of every month. Father Stephen DeYoung has been very faithful, has never missed a month with us. He's a priest in our diocese, which is so wonderful to have him as one of our uh, priests. He's become a very good friend of mine, and uh, he gives he gives us an hour and a half of his time, a really in in depth Bible study uh, for men. And we've been studying and focused on different men in Scripture. We started with the King and Prophet David. We went on to the story of Abraham. Now we're going through Moses. And so Father Stephen's doing it a little differently for this Bible study and giving us a perspective as men on these um, these incredible men from Scripture. Uh, but you can just sign up for our newsletter on the website. If you go to antiochianmen.org, scroll to the bottom, sign up at the bottom of the homepage, and you'll get the uh, the Zoom link for our upcoming events, including the Bible studies. We have a quarterly leadership meeting, our virtual retreats, and, and many other things that we have planned. And our second annual Antiochian Men Conference and Retreat. We're tentatively planning already. We have the date. So if I could, I can share that just tentatively. Please it's do. November, yeah. yeah. So November 5th through the 8th of 2025. It's okay. more than a year from now, but we're going to be adding a day. Uh, we only did Thursday to Saturday this last time. We're going to do Wednesday to Saturday. We're adding a day and we have some incredible speakers that are tentatively planned. I can't say who they are yet, uh, but it will be at the same location, which is the Woodland Christian Camp and Retreat Center in Temple, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, which is a great central location for our diocese. And, you know, again, we had 46 people from outside of our diocese come to that conference just a few weeks ago and 140 men total, which was great for a first event. And so, you know, I encourage anyone just to check out what we have going on and to steal shamelessly from what we've done. We're not mm -hmm. trying to keep any secrets. So if you're from the OCA, the, the GOA, the ROCOR, I mean, this need is everywhere. And I've been hearing success stories across all jurisdictions. You know, Lisa, you talked about at the very beginning, the importance of talking to people from other jurisdictions. Yeah. When we were at our event in Temple, Georgia, just, you know, at the early parts of last month, I got to meet people from the OCA, from the Greek Archdiocese, talking to those men and how excited they were to start something similar. And I know it's already started. And I get asked to come and give talks all the time and on Zoom or in person with a lot of these groups. Uh, our spiritual advisor, Father Hans Jacobsi, does the same thing. And these brotherhoods, they almost self-generate. Once you just have that one person to take the lead and to get things going, it's amazing the creative energy that gets unleashed and the great good that it can do to local parishes. So yeah, check out what we have going on. Our YouTube channel, you can find us. It's Domsey Amen. So it's D-O-M-S-E. And then A M E N. Dom C is just Diocese of Miami in the Southeast. You can find that on YouTube as well. So if someone goes to, say, a Greek church or an OCA church, can they come to your can they come to your event or should they look they up have been. on I'll theirs? You, is they, that okay? Okay. Yes. I mean, people have registered for our events, people have shown up to our Bible studies. And we're not in the business of, of kicking people out. We're not telling Good. people that you can't be here. Uh, we welcome everyone. I'll tell you, though, that we have to remember that it's our diocese, right? So we we mark it to our diocese. We say, hey, this is a diocese event. Um, you know, I'm attending a parish life conference in the Northeast. It's not my diocese. I was invited to talk, actually, to the men in the Diocese of Worcester and in, in New England at, coming oh, up neat. in June. So I'm going to be giving a, a talk to the men there and essentially doing an Antiochian men kickoff for them in the Northeast. So there are people that attend events from other dioceses. There's no rule against it, but we're not, you know, we want to be careful because it's, it's, it's not like 
we're trying to go go past our jurisdictional boundaries and trying to right. tell people from outside of our diocese what to do. We're not doing that at all. We just we tell people what has worked for us, and we ask them uh, to to take it and run with it. Do what you want with it. We're again not trying to keep anything to ourselves. We have a constitution. We have a parish chapter charter that people can use. Uh, as an example, to create something similar. But we're in the business of sharing. This is what's worked for us and and hope that it helps others to do the same. You know, it's an interesting thing about having so many different jurisdictions, right? Because if there were one jurisdiction, you would just be doing this for whatever, Miami and probably just Florida or something, right? But if you can look at it as a strength and say, well, what this means is that we have a number of different groups all working on the same problem, getting yeah. inspiration from one another, learning from one another, and also working on the same problem in different ways, yeah. which might work for different populations in different ways, right? Like we can look at this as a strength, as us having just this sort of manifold effort, or we can, you know, we can worry about those other things. But yeah. uh, I think it's nicer to just think about it as let's be inspired by one another and join together with one another. And uh, you, and I think the truth is when, when you're addressing a real need in the church, in God's church, and you're humble and you let the Holy Spirit guide it, there's no stopping it. It goes crazy. Yeah, that's, oh, that's wonderful. That's just wonderful. I love uh, I love how well all of this is going, Michael. I know when you and I first met, it was really earlier in it because you guys got mm-hmm. started in 2019 and then yeah. COVID hit, which I would imagine slowed you down a yeah, little bit. It did. It, it was very difficult to have to restart after we had such momentum to get going. Although I'll tell you that COVID has only accelerated, I think, the influx of people into the Orthodox Church, especially men. Yeah. So in a way... It did have us. We did have to pause a lot of local chapters' activities, but mm-hmm. they all restarted very quickly. Now we have leadership in all 41 parishes, now 42 parishes in our diocese. We have an Antiochian men chapter with a leader that I can reach out to, uh, that we can organize and uh, get on a Zoom meeting. We have leadership meetings with those leaders quarterly. And But what's beautiful, though, Elisa, is that every chapter is different. Every church is different. So what we do is we, we, we rise up to what the needs are of the parish, and every parish has different needs. And so although we have a constitution and there's a parish chapter charter and something to follow, it's important to have structure and to be organized. Every parish is going to look different. You may have a small mission parish. You may have a huge cathedral. You may have an older church building that needs more maintenance where the men can go up and and just help fix some things. There's a a success story where a widow needed her house painted and nobody could help her. So the men organized, bought the paint and just painted her house for her. I mean, little things like this, every church is going to look different. There's some churches that maybe are expanding and growing like my church just paid off its mortgage and you're looking for a new building or to grow. Maybe you need the men to step up and help out on a building committee. Maybe you need to to look at expanding your existing structure. Look at who are the contractors, who are the people that work in the construction field in your parish. So even though you know we're we're very similar in structure, you're going to have very different needs. And then the the God given creativity that men are given is unleashed, and it looks different. The men are given the flexibility to work in concert with their priest, right? It's important. And also to make sure they're working with the parish council to get things approved, following those processes that are important. But it's going to look different. Each parish is different. So we want the men to own that brotherhood locally and to do what's right for their parish. That's excellent. That's and and that's you know once again right it's just that sort of ser- servant leadership stuff right it's what kind of resources can we give you and then you use your creativity and you yes. look at your resources and you that's run it. with it that's exactly and that's, our model yes yeah I mean that's what God does with us right you know He gives us these resources He gives us this support and He says you know here are your talents go figure it out no, don't you, bury them yeah God figure something out do all the yeah God doesn't do all the work for us and we have to do our part and. On the Antiochian Men Board, our board members for the last five years have been committed to providing all the parishes with resources, with the content that we've been creating, with success stories being shared from parish to parish, with connecting the parishes together so we can share those success stories, those best practices, so that another parish can do it, maybe improve on it, and then share that out. I mean, that's it's done in corporate America all the time. There's no reason why we can't do it in the church. So having it almost like a cross-functional team model within the church. There are some good parts of business that we can apply. And that's what I 
by the grace of God, have been able to at least start doing. And I'm very grateful for all the men that have stepped up to help me out as well on the board and, and all the local parishes as well. It's been quite a blessing. Oh, thank God. That's fantastic. And, you know, it just it's funny. As we've been talking, I just keep thinking about when I was a kid, my mom did not like icons. We weren't Orthodox, right? But she'd seen, you know, she was like, oh, these Catholics and these other guys there, they always make Jesus look weak. And men aren't weak. Men are strong, right? And it was like, so she had a picture of Jesus. So he was real muscle bound. He was a very kind of a Rambo Jesus. And she really liked that. And my family was really big on this idea that, oh, he was a carpenter. He would have had big muscles. But, you know, talk a little bit about, like, you know, as Orthodox, we look at Christ as our model of a man. And he's not this, like, muscle bound, you know, rule by the mighty kind of guy. It's a different kind of strength, right? Like what is the essence of like Christian masculine strength? What, what does that mean? Yeah. And, and I, I mentioned a little bit of this earlier. I did an interview with Jonathan Pajot for our YouTube channel and he, he, I think used a great example. I'll borrow that is, is that the early church actually struggled with how to, how to portray an iconography, the crucifixion, because you're seeing a man executed right? So how do you show Christ, who is not a victim, essentially being executed on the cross as the victor? And so Jonathan Pajot had a, a beautiful commentary on this. The early earlier forms of iconography of the crucifixion showed Christ kind of standing in front of the cross with a royal robe, uh, so that he was standing victorious in front of the cross, which I thought was fascinating. And if you look at some more Western even maybe Roman Catholic depictions, it might be Christ hanging a very bloodied version on the cross. That's not how we see Christ. So Christ, as I said earlier, ascended the cross voluntarily. So this was truly the ultimate act of a warrior. He could have called down legion, legions of angels. He could have he could have done anything. But that is essentially, as men, what we should then be looking in our own lives of how we can do the same thing to different degrees by taking up our own crosses, right? So it's not how can we go and become victims? How can we be victimized? It's how can we take the stuff of reality? How can we embrace the reality of our circum circumstance, not run from that cross? How can we embrace that? And in so doing, become more like Christ, because that's exactly what he did, right? That's the, the, that's the little piece that I didn't get when I was younger that we really need to embrace whatever the reality is. And when you do that, whatever your situation, your circumstance is, you offer that to God, right? And so that strength comes from within. That strength comes and Christ gives us this because, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane is very interesting because he, he, Christ even asks if there's some other way for this to pass, please let it. You know, nobody wants to go into a situation where they're tortured to death, but he knew that that had to happen and he did it anyway. That's what love is. So in the Antiochian men, our, our values are leadership, obedience, vigilance, endurance. And the first letter of each of those spells out the word love, and that's on purpose. Love is an action. Love is doing the right thing, even when you're not feeling it, maybe especially when you're not feeling it. So the strength of manhood, the strength that Christ gives us in the Gospels as an image is that of someone who's willing to do whatever, it, whatever needs to be done, regardless of whether we're feeling it or not, whether we want to do it or not. Okay, that's the strength that's needed. That's the leadership that men need to show in our families, in the workplace, with our friends, and especially in the church to really emulate what Christ has laid out for us as the ultimate example of someone who's willing to do whatever it takes, regardless of what it means for me personally. So, so that strength really does start from within. In some cases, you may have to protect. You know, men provide and protect. Sometimes you have to physically protect somebody. Yes, that's true, but you can also provide for and protect environments for people to flourish. And that should be done in, the, in our parishes. If our men step up and are strong leaders and the women then fill those parishes with life, it'll be amazing what could really be accomplished in a parish. And the parishes that are doing this well are growing significantly, and it's, it's no coincidence. You know, we have to be worthy of the people that Christ is, is leading to our church. We have to be worthy of them. So we have to get ready because more are coming. That is beautifully put. That's our challenge, guys. 
I love that. We have to be worthy of them. And it's, it's absolutely true. And it's, I'm seeing beautiful things happen all over the place. So, uh, yeah. Michael, thank you so much for coming on the program. I'm, My pleasure. I'm so inspired by everything that you're doing. And I want to remind our listeners, antiochianmen.org. And just, you know, search Antiochian Men. It's going to come up over, all over the place, as you heard, right? Newsletters, podcasts, Bible studies, online conferences, in-person conferences. There's a lot of stuff for you. So uh, we hope that you guys will look that up. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience. And we'll see you next week with another Everyday Orthodox Christian. Good night. <laughs>